Um, this is my first Aspie lunch, and I've had, heard very good things um, from the Canberra team about this luncheon series and the quality of the speakers. So I'm delighted to be representing HP today at this session. The future of the Australian-US alliance is also a highly relevant topic for HP. As an American company, we celebrated our 45th year operating in Australia this year. However, from 1947 until HP's incorporation in Australia in 1967, HP products were available in Australia through a Melbourne-based distributor called Sample Electronics. So our history in Australia is well aligned with the history of the Australian-US alliance and predates the formal ANSYS agreement. It is also a little known fact in Australia that one of our founders, Dave Packard, took leave of absence from HP between 1969 to 1972 to serve as the Deputy Secretary of Defence. Commenting on his frustrations during his time at Defence, Packard said it was like pushing one end of a 40-foot rope and trying to get the other in to do what you want. And on that historical anecdote, I'd like to introduce our panel for today. Moderating today's panel will be Catherine McGrath, the political editor for Australia's international television service, the Australian Network. For more than 20 years, Catherine has led the coverage for ABC News for both Canberra and abroad. Our panel also comprises three of the United States leading thinkers on defence and strategic policy. Dr. Patrick Conn, oh, sorry, apologies, Cronin, is the Senior Advisor and Senior Director of the Asia Pacific Security Program at the Centre for a New American Security. Previously, Dr. Cronin was the Director of the Institute for the National Strategic Studies at the National Defence University and has a nearly 30-year career inside government and academic research centres spanning defence affairs, foreign policy and development assistance. Mr Douglas Fyth is the Senior Fellow and Director of the Centre for National Security Strategies at the Hudson Institute. In addition to a lengthy career in both the private and public sectors, Mr Fyth served as Under Secretary for Defence for policy from July 2001 until August 2005. In that position, he helped devise the US government's strategy for the war on terrorism and contributed to policy for the Afghan and Iraq campaigns. Admiral Gary Roughhead was the US Chief of Naval Operations from August 2007 until September 2011. Prior to that, he was the commander of the US Fleet Forces and the 31st commander of the Pacific Fleet. During his distinguished career in the US Navy, Admiral Roughhead was awarded the Defense Distinguished Service Medal, the Navy Distinguished Service Medal, the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Legion of Merit Meritus Service Medal, the Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal, the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal, and various unit and service awards. Finally, we have the Australian representation on the panel, ANSPA's own Executive Director, Mr Peter Jennings. Peter's career has included extensive experience advising in government at senior levels, developing major strategic policy documents, conducting crisis management, and researching, writing, and teaching international security. Most recently, Peter was the Deputy Secretary for Strategy in the Australian Department of Defence. Please join me in welcoming today's panel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and welcome to this uh, ASPE discussion. For those of you like me who've been attending ASPE functions since they began and now with its third director, they'll know this is a new thing. To actually have uh, control of the discussion away from the director, I think he's rather excited. And we'll see what happens. And I must say, when Peter and his team suggested it, I thought I should let them know that letting a journalist be in charge is a bit like giving the car keys to the teenager. However, I decided not to warn him. 
and uh, we just uh, see how it all falls. So thank you. Peter would like it to be a, a vibrant and interesting discussion, so uh, later on we'll be uh, speaking to some people on the floor as well, and uh, all of our speakers will be uh, going through their specialist topics. So welcome. We're thrilled to have such an esteemed group. We're going to start off with five minutes from each speaker, and uh, we meet at a time when the US Alliance, Australia-US Alliance, is at a fascinating time, and the pivot or the rebalance is underway. And one thing I'm interested in is, it, is it a pivot or is it a rebalance, or have the marketing people got involved and changed the name, or was it always a rebalance? Uh, as we meet, Parliament is meeting, uh, in, sitting in, in Canberra. The Prime Minister this morning gave her update on Afghanistan, which included uh, information that uh, more soldiers would be going in to help with the transfer or to the, the pull out of, of forces. Uh, in the US, emergencies have been declared in uh, New York and New Jersey, and our thoughts are with our American visitors today and for the people there as they deal with it. And of course, elections in a week in the US, and that will of course, of course affect uh, US policy no matter the outcome, and Australia faces an election within about 12 months. So we'll start off, first of all, with our panel having five minutes. It will be a fairly strict five minutes so that we can move through, and we'll start uh, first of all with Douglas Fyth, closest to the chair. Douglas has been speaking, as have the others, uh, to a closed-door session for the last two days. Uh, Douglas's special area of discussion was on uh, Islamic extremism in the region. He's going to talk for five minutes on that and the US-Australia alliance. Douglas, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to, to meet with you and uh, contribute to the discussions that uh, are important for the, for the alliance. Uh, an alliance has to be cultivated and, uh, and, and meeting with people, exchanging ideas, coming up with a common understanding of, of what the problems in the world are is uh, essential to the functioning of an alliance. The, before I get to the topic uh, that I talked about at the conference on, on Islamist extremism, I, I think it might be worthwhile just to say a word or two about uh, the, the principal topic du jour, it seems to be the, this whole issue of the pivot and uh, or rebalancing of, of U.S. Um, strategic interest toward the Asia Pacific area. The point that I would like to stress is, first of all, there is a history to this. Uh, this was a major theme of Bush administration policy. And it's important to stress that because it's important to show the, the bipartisan support for the strategic idea that the United States has major strategic interest and an awareness thereof uh, in the Asia Pacific region, a commitment to remain a significant power here. Now, so at the conceptual level, I think there's broad-based support. I think the, the, the idea of the pivot at that strategic level is a very good idea. What concerns me is I don't see the commitment by the Obama administration of defense resources adequate to make the pivot a, uh, a serious fact in reality. I mean, it's, at the moment, it's a, it's a concept. I think the concept is sound, but it requires an investment, and I don't, I don't see the investment uh, being substantial enough. That's one problem. Another, the, the, the other final point I would make on the pivot that I think is important is there are too many commentators, in my view, who tend to look at the question of American commitment to a region with reference to the assets, the military assets that the United States happens to have deployed in that region at a particular time. And the reason that that's a wrong perspective is we don't have a separate military for the Asia Pacific region and a separate military for Europe and a separate military for the Middle East. We have a single defense force for the whole world. And nobody should put too much significance in how many forces happen to be deployed in a given region at a given time. What is really significant is the ability of the United States to bring military resources to bear in an area when it's necessary. So we may be building up you know, a few thousand 
you know, Marines in Darwin, which is something I think is terrific and, and a worthwhile exercise. But if we're not funding the US defense budget adequately globally, then I, I don't think that anybody should think that it's a highly significant thing that we happen to be putting uh, you know, a few thousand troops Just in. Just one minute to go, extremism. On the, on the point about Islamist extremism, the, the main message that, uh, of the paper that I have been talking about at, the, at our conference in the last few days, at the US Study Center conference, is a large number of people in the United States and around the world started thinking about the Islamist extremism problem in a serious way as a result of 9-11. And so the general view was that the ideological challenges represented by Islamist extremism are a subset of the terrorism problem. I think that it's really wiser to view it the other way around, that there is a serious problem of ideological extremism on the part of this subset of people within the, the Muslim communities around the world, and that the terrorism problem is just a part of the broader ideological challenge. And I think that we need to take the ideological challenge seriously because what it, what it means is there are a significant number of people who think they are at war with us. And we have to understand that whether, whether we like to deal with an ideological challenge or not, and Western liberal democracies tend to be uncomfortable with that. Nevertheless, whether we like it or not, they think that they're at Lots odds with us. Lots to talk about over the coming 50 minutes. Admiral Gary Ruffhead most recently was the Chief of Navy, commander in both the Pacific and the Atlantic. In Australia, he's been talking specifically about issues of interoperability. Right, so, great. So, big picture. Okay, thanks. And uh, one thing that was left out of my biography is I am a relative of your footballer, Jared Ruffhead. I taught him everything he knows, and that's the <laughs> ultimate. That's the ultimate in interoperability. So, um, but um, you know, to me, uh, U.S.-Australian interoperability comes very easy. Uh, I think it's based in the shared experiences that we have, but also in the national characteristics that we both share, that allow us to look at problems, move on, solve them, cooperate. Uh, not be overly concerned about uh, the, where the credit goes. So um, for me, the issue has been one of how do we advance uh, interoperability as we move forward into the future. And I think there are some terrific opportunities. Um, but we also have to be mindful of, of things um, that can be problematic for those who will partner with us. Um, Australia and the United States have embraced jointness to a level that no other militaries in the world have, in my opinion. And as we grow more sophisticated in our approaches there, we have to be mindful of the partners, whether they're occasional partners or interest-driven partners, and how do we keep them coupled? How can we bring them in? So we can, we, even though we focus on US-Australian interoperability, I think we have to be mindful of other applications and other uh, groupings that we'll have. I think that as I look at interoperability, it's very easy to jump to some of the, uh, the systems that we may want to buy or to talk about basing. I think the first thing that we should do is we look at the US's reaffirmation, as Doug said, of rebalancing. And I only use the word pivot to criticize it because I think it's a horrible term. We're not going to turn away from the Middle East. Um, but we are going to put more of a focus here. But uh, I think it's time to look at the governance of how we work out issues of interoperability, uh, particularly how we align our strategic thinking with the acquisitions that, are, that will enable us to be more effective going forward. I think we have to look at governance as to how we um, deal with people exchanges. Right now, it's an exchange process. I think that's very inefficient and very limiting. Uh, something that I espouse is something called cross-assignment, where you can have different numbers in different countries, and they don't have to be a one-for-one. One. Uh, but I would also say that as I look at the operational side of things, uh, we need to become more serious about anti-submarine warfare in the region. Uh, submarines are growing faster in this region than anywhere else. Uh, we both are investing in capabilities that will allow us, whether it's airplanes, ships, or submarines, uh, to be more effective, but we have had an overly focused force on the Middle East, and those skills have, have atrophied. Uh, air defense is another area that um, interoperability will become increasingly important. Of course, command and control. 
Uh, that one we have to be mindful of, particularly for the occasional partners that come in and that we don't distance ourselves too far from that. Uh, I think that there are opportunities for training, um, but we need to be upfront about resourcing the kit that we can leave in places in Australia or places in the United States so that as the people move back and forth to train, they're not having to haul and incur the costs uh, associated with that. Uh, I also believe that we should look seriously at uh, combined joint headquarters uh, that are standing, that are in standby for the types of contingencies that we know will be taking place, whether it's a humanitarian problem uh, or uh, trying to control events if, if uh, things begin to get out of control. And I think those are some of the areas that, uh, that we can look at, and I look forward to your questions. Great. And uh, Dr. Patrick Cronin has been thinking, talking, writing about uh, the South China Sea longer than many of the people in this room, but some people in the room have been doing it, uh, speaking about it as well. But it's a highly specialised area and he brings great detail to this subject and just having a look at the things he's written and spoken about. I know in Australia we talk a lot about the South China Sea, but personally I don't think we get very specific about what's happening, where it's happening, what the Chinese reaction has been, and Patrick has spoken quite a lot about that. Here he's been discussing all of this behind uh, the closed door session and he'll um, share some of those thoughts with us now. Well, Catherine, thank you and thanks to Aspie and to all of you for coming out on this beautiful day. Let me first say two quick comments that play on what uh, uh, we just heard about rebalancing. Uh, two important points. The first one is that unless you operationalize it in the way that Admiral Ruffhead's talked about, unless you resource it the way that Doug Fyth talked about, all this rhetoric is for naught. Um, and th this is really where the rubber meets the road. Uh, you have to join your strategy with your operational plans. You have to resource them properly. And this is what our own politics and your politics are often uh, in necessarily engaged on. That's why we have these experts here to think through how to do that. Uh, the second point on rebalancing is that what's important about it is a long-term reprioritization toward a rising Asia Pacific it's akin to the Asia Century report in this respect. It's a recognition that the great opportunity uh, in the 21st century is really, is really uh, here in the Asia Pacific region. And we recognize that across our party lines. We've recognized it for some time, and we're moving in that direction. But the flip side of that, and that's really what I want to talk about, is that there are real security challenges that are standing in the way of that opportunity. Uh, one of the big ones that I won't only mention in 15 seconds is the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the fact that North Korea is continuing to acquire nuclear weapons, it could go from an arsenal of maybe 11 or 12 nuclear weapons up to 48, according to one recent report. Over the next four years alone, it's trying to acquire long-range missile systems. It has a very unpredictable, untested government in Kim Jong-un, um, and there are signs that there could be a, a military backlash. That could all erupt in a moment, in, a, in an instant really, in terms of one missile launch uh, getting out of control, one firing across the northern limit line. What we see in the South China Sea, but also in the East China Sea, with Japan and China in particular, uh, over the Senkaku, uh, Daiyutai uh, Islands, you have um, a, 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 a two things going on. One of them is a strategic reassessment within China over the last few years, trying to move away from the <coughs> bide your time and hide your capabilities maxim of Deng Xiaoping um, because of the American commitments in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last decade in, the, in, in fighting terrorism, uh, because of the 2008 Wall Street led, uh, I put that in inverted commas, um, global financial crisis. That's how the Chinese talked about it. And they talked such a good game that I think they convinced many in the PLA and others in the standing committee that China now needed to reassert its own influence over the littoral, semi-enclosed littoral seas in the East and South China Sea, and think about sea lines of communication all the way across the Indian Ocean as vital or core strategic interests. And that's the debate that's still ongoing in China at a critical time. Um, so we saw the growing assertiveness out of China in the South China Sea, especially in the Spratly Islands, uh, more recently uh, in this April, beginning this April, in Scarborough Shoal uh, with the Philippines trying to intercede with a gray hold uh, naval flagship, which really had been a 40 plus year old US former Coast Guard cutter that we had given to the Philippines. 
And when that encountered Chinese law enforcement uh, vessels, um, Philippines was convinced that they should back down and kind of replace it with a civilian ship. Um, the long and short of it is that eventually the Chinese placed all of their ships around this horseshoe-shaped Scarborough Shoal and to this very day control it and have de facto control over this area that's far removed from the Chinese mainland and within, uh, well within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. Um, it's created a huge question about the rebalancing and the practicality of how do you build up an ally like the Philippines to at least be able to have a modest ma naval maritime presence to defend its interests over these disputes. And how do you regionally work with ASEAN and others in the region to build the kind of the diplomatic infrastructure that's needed to eventually find ways to resolve these disputes that aren't going to be resolved soon? Uh, in the East China Sea with Japan, um, this is much more dangerous than is commonly seen. In fact, the good friend M. Taylor Fravel at an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal just recently, he's done the exhaustive academic studies in the U.S. on territorial disputes of China. Um, and he notes that 17 of the 23 territorial disputes that have been solved peacefully by China since its uh, creation as the PRC in 1949 uh, have left six crises that were not settled peacefully. And they were all against well-armed countries, uh, Russia, India, uh, Vietnam, and Taiwan. And they all came at a time of regime instability and uncertainty. And I really want to end sort of with this point right now because um, there's so much uncertainty in China, you know, from uh, the whole story of Wen Jiabao's uh, corruption in terms of uh, being worth, his family being worth billions of dollars. He's hired two high-priced New York lawyers to help show he's not rich. Um, uh, the, um, the, the fact that um, Bo Zhilai and the way he was brought down, um, uh, an incredible story and saga, uh, has opened up sort of the can of worms about the corruption and inequality that has uh, seeped into this rapidly rising uh, China. Um, even though the recent moves on the military commission seem to, sh to show professionalism over uh, jingoism, there's a lot of nationalism being fueled into these current disputes over the Senkaku and the, and the Spratleys, as well as with the parasols with Vietnam that could erupt here. And they're going to require very careful management, domain, you know, everything from maritime domain awareness with allies like Australia, frankly, and others, to the diplomatic infrastructure. And Indonesian foreign minister um, who told me recently that, look, we're not going to resolve these things anytime in the next 20 years, but we have to figure out some kind of diplomatic framework that we can try to keep them within the bounds. And that's one of the tricks. And Australia's got such a critical role to play in all these issues on, over time. So uh, it's hard to get into the details of issues this complex. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, Peter Jennings, from your perspective, there's a lot to talk about. Most recently, you were in the Department of Defence where these decisions were being made about Australia and the pivot and the rebalance. Um, how do you think that has gone? the last uh, 12, 18 months, the arrival of the troops in Darwin, the reception in the region, and some of the issues on South China Sea, if you could just reflect on that. Sure. Catherine, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I, I'll go back to your question at the very beginning of this, which was, um, is the pivot here to stay? And uh, my, my answer to that is, uh, I think very definitely, um, the language may change in terms of how it's described, but the uh, broader US intent of remaining deeply engaged in the, in the Asia Pacific, uh, I, I think, is uh, uncontested ground between the, the major parties. Interestingly, uh, uh, Stephen Loosley and I heard a story about the pivot uh, when we were at a conference in Honolulu just a, a few days ago, uh, because there's no doubt that um, State Department officials worked very hard to try to have the language change shortly after the President's uh, speech uh, here in Canberra at the end of um, 2011. Um, and Secretary uh, Clinton um, uh, insisted on putting the term back in. Uh, you'd note in the third foreign policy debate, the President also referred to the pivot. Um, and uh, Clinton's line apparently is, uh, she likes the term uh, because the President likes the term. And the President likes the term because he sees it as a uh, basketball analogy, and he gets it. Uh, and so I think if the, if the Democrats are returned, it will remain the pivot. Uh, and if it's a Romney administration, it will, it will be a, a, a rebalance or a, or a, a new phrase uh, altogether. Um, in terms of the success so far and what the Australian part of that uh, has amounted to, I, I think there's been pretty good progress in terms of 
what was called phase one of the plan, which was to uh, start the uh, marine deployments into the Northern Territory and to consider the uh, options for uh, uh, more comprehensive uh, exercising with, uh, with the US Air Force. I do have a little concern, and it also reflects uh, some of the things my colleagues have been saying about keeping the momentum going for these activities into both the short term and the medium term. Uh, now, both countries have in fact said that they, they will um, uh, 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 try to prevent the impact of defence spending cuts from, in the case of the US, impacting on its Asian Pacific presence, in the case of Australia, the Minister for Defence saying that he'd ring-fenced alliance cooperation uh, in terms of the spending cuts. I think, though, that there is a risk because uh, you, you can't sort of um, uh, corral the budget as narrowly as that. Um, and I'm concerned, in particular, in the Australian case, that, for example, we won't see the spend on facilities which is needed to create the necessary infrastructure in the Northern Territory to support those activities. Um, in fact, my, my view would be now that um, uh, alliances are really sustained by active engagement and that what we need to do to think beyond the next, or, or think to the next stage of, of uh, pivot cooperation. Um, phase two has been identified, and that is a greater presence in the Indian Ocean region. Um, and I would uh, say that I think what that means is not uh, US carrier battle groups uh, home ported at uh, HMAS Sterling, but I do think we can look to uh, numbers of major US fleet units operating out of uh, Sterling. We, we now need to be thinking about stage two of the pivot beyond the Marines and the Air Force. Uh, in short, I think we need to bring on more quickly the, uh, the process of Marine, uh, oh, sorry, of uh, US Navy um, uh, lengthy deployments out of uh, HMAS uh, uh, Sterling. Uh, beyond that, um, where to in the, in the alliance relationship? There, there, are, there are two things that I would mention which I think are significant and need to be implemented to create a sense of uh, further momentum. One is cooperation on space situational awareness. Uh, there was a public uh, statement about uh, space situational awareness in the 2010 Osman Declaration, and now I think, frankly, there's a desperate need to give some substance to that uh, by uh, more fully uh, integrating how our uh, military organisations work uh, with each other. Uh, to implement space situational awareness in terms of being able to watch satellite movements uh, and missile movements. Beyond that, I think that there is now a growing opportunity in uh, ballistic missile defence cooperation. Um, and for those of you that haven't picked it up yet, I would recommend that you have a look at Chapter 9 of the uh, Asian Century White Paper, uh, where um, rather surprisingly nestled in a handful of paragraphs on arms control, is a statement about the importance of um, Australia and its friends and allies in the region to undertake closer ballistic missile defence cooperation. Um, as I said in an ASPE blog on the ASPE strategist, to which I'm sure you're, you're all subscribing, uh, well done that drafter, um, whoever it was that got that paragraph in an otherwise fairly bland uh, chapter. Um, and where I think that needs to go pretty, pretty quickly is in Australian government consideration of uh, equipping our uh, air warfare destroyers with the uh, SM-3 missile, which has a ballistic missile defence capability. And beyond that, thinking about a fourth air warfare destroyer, uh, which I do believe would be a, a more cost-effective uh, and, frankly, more achievable uh, military uh, uh, capability development for the ADF. Uh, than to talk about doubling our submarine fleet. Thanks, Peter. Well, a lot to talk about. Um, the biggest development, really, in the alliance in recent history is the, is the pivot, and it's probably one of the most dramatic changes or alterations or progressions in defence policy in this region for, for quite some time. Uh, yet its acceptance in the region is, is debated. In this morning's paper, we hear from uh, uh, Chinese Lieutenant General Ren, who called it an interference, complicating a new security order. There are great sensitivities in the region. Can we reflect briefly in the panel? Um, you know, starting with that, it's very complicated, but can we speak frankly? What, what yeah. do you do? I think that the rebalance and the stated commitment of the US to be present in a significant way 
militarily, but also with the economic focus, diplomatic focus, I think has been very well received by most of the countries in the region. Um, clearly, uh, China uh, sees it as encirclement, and then in some recent discussions I had when I was there, they take the rebalance and then they couple the air-sea battle to that, and that's just proof positive that, um, that it is encirclement. Uh, but I would, I would say that um, it is consistent with uh, our ability to match uh, technological developments within the region. Uh, it also, uh, particularly when you talk about air-sea battle, is not all about the Western Pacific. Uh, we have anti-access uh, area denial challenges in the Arabian Gulf. And then when you look at the proliferation of very sophisticated weapons, uh, I believe that we uh, live in a world where anti-access is going to be present even in what heretofore has been some pretty benign areas. For example, if years ago, if you wanted to do a non-combatant evacuation of Beirut, you sailed some amphibious ships in there and you take the people out. Uh, Hezbollah changed that in 2006 when they very nearly sank uh, an Israeli ship with a very sophisticated uh, anti-ship missile, and Hezbollah is not even a state. So mm. the whole idea of the capabilities that we're fielding is just relevant to the world that we live in today. Patrick Cron, this is your area, really, um, North Asia. How do you read China's reaction? Well, you can look at it uh, at least two ways, but it's not a binary choice between sort of driving China to war or capitulating to China. There really is a middle ground that we're going to have to operate in that, that most people in this room, I'm sure, know very well. Um, we need more engagement with China, uh, militarily, politically, ec and certainly economically, uh, with business as well. Um, and many of us, and the Australians and the United States are both pursuing this kind of cooperation. But on the other hand, sometimes that cooperation doesn't necessarily build the trust that the Chinese profess to want. And I think the comments from Lieutenant General Wren uh, are case in point. But so too, just a month ago when Secretary Panetta was in China, um, the chief of staff of the military uh, essentially embarrassed the secretary by, in the last question, a planted question, um, he talked about how bad all of what Japan was doing and what U.S.-Japan were doing in the region, and the Secretary could give no defense. That's hardly building trust uh, on these issues. So yes, China has growing, increased, legitimate interests in sea lines of communication, in the littoral seas, and they're going to be part of a discussion. We want them to be part of an inclusive discussion, maybe with ASEAN centrality, kind of providing the diplomatic backdrop for the kind of a broad multilateral discussion that can go on, but in the meantime, don't give up your deterrence and defense. Um, you know, you don't give up your insurance policy. Uh, as we see with the tensions with Japan and China just in recent weeks that are not going away, um, this is a very serious problem. It requires strong United States presence and strong alliances as the backbone of any multilateral diplomacy. Douglas Fife, strong deterrence is uh, one of your your uh, strong beliefs. Uh, do you think that Australia and the US just have to live with this Chinese concern? Can they do anything about it? And also, can you reflect on Hugh White, a former director of ASPE, has put out a thesis in Australia about Australia taking a role in helping the US see a different view of China, perhaps make more room for China. Are you aware of that thesis and what are your thoughts on that? Well, there's no question that China is going to be taking up more room as it grows. And uh, uh, no realistic assessment suggests that anybody has an option to prevent China from growing. China's going to grow, and that's not inherently a bad thing. Uh, the, the question that you raised highlights the tension between different interests that the United States has, uh, that the alliance has, um, all of which are important, but so, some of which are in tension with each other. I mean, we have an interest in reassuring our allies about our continued presence, commitment to remain a major power in this area. We also have an interest in ensuring that we don't develop relations with China such that chi the Chinese become our enemy. So we're not looking to be provocative. We're not looking to agitate them. Uh, and. And yet we are looking to reassure our allies that we're here and we're going to be strong. But so is the, provocative, is, is agitation a byproduct of, of being there, of being strong, of being Well, to, I mean, to, uh, that's what I'm saying. There's, there's inherent tension. 
there are certain things that we have to do. We can't prevent the Chinese from misinterpreting or overreacting. That's, that's a problem. But we should certainly not be seeking to you know, needlessly provoke them. I think that, that uh, the, the important, the thing of greatest importance, uh, which I assume the Chinese pay most attention to, is what our actual capabilities are. And I know that the pivot dialogue, the, the pivot discussion, the, 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 the language about it, the discussion of it in the United States, has done some good in reassuring allies. It has been taken by the Chinese as a provocation. Some of that you can shrug and say, well, that, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. That's an inherent trade-off. But if we don't back it, with real capability, then we have the worst of both worlds. Then we have a provoked China without serious capability. That we should make sure we guard against. Peter Jennings, Australia's perspective is a little different, a little broader. We live in this region. We have to um, relate well to our neighbours in a different way. And we're a smaller and obviously this powerful country. So what are the issues you see with, that, with the response in the region? Uh, look, in terms of uh, China's response, I, I would put it into the category of, of what I've heard a senior a US official describe as, you know, tough-edged military diplomacy. Uh, in other words, uh, I don't think anyone in, uh, in uh, planning circles in China really thinks that uh, 2,500 Marines in Darwin is a, is a dagger pointed at the heart of Beijing. Nevertheless, they will use it and their um, concern over uh, uh, the, the rebalancing effort to um, you know, provide their own opportunity for diplomatic comment and pressure in, in the region. I, I personally don't think we should be too worried about that. One thing is clear. Um, whatever we did with the US, the Chinese didn't see it as being dire enough to want to complicate their own good relations with Australia, um, which has continued on seamlessly since the, since the, the President's announcement. Where I think there is something that could be done, um, uh, perhaps by the US alone, maybe in, in concert with Australia, is that I, I think it's time for uh, the next administration to think about issuing a new East Asia strategy document. Um, there have been four of these in the past. We haven't seen one during the, the first term of the Obama administration. And I think it would be a very useful thing for the US to do in order to ensure that it is able to explain the broader diplomatic sense of its purpose in the Asia-Pacific region and not leave the interpretation of its actions to military movements or indeed consideration of the um, um, air, air sea battle concept. All of these things are a necessary part of America's credibility as a military power in this region. Uh, but I think a new East Asia strategy would actually help to set some diplomatic context and perhaps reduce the sense of um, Chinese capacity to make diplomatic use of this for, for their own purposes. Beyond China, it's not just about them. Uh, you know, in the wider region, there is a strong sense, I think, of endorsement of the um, American rebalance to the region. And, and I would cite uh, uh, President Udiono at the... Um, Shangri-La dialogue uh, in Singapore uh, uh, five or six months ago where when he was asked helpfully by a New Zealander about what did this all mean and uh, was it was it destabilizing to the region um, his answer was uh, uh, absolutely not and he, he welcomed it and looked forward to the opportunity for trilateral uh, uh, cooperation between Australia the US and Indonesia. I might get the panel to reflect on those points and especially the, the thought of a new paper looking at East Asia. I might start with Patrick and while we're doing that on the on the floor if you've got some questions I'm going to wander through in a minute you can think about them. I might start Patrick first of all and also Patrick people have very front of mind the US election can you include some thoughts on that and uh, the attitude Thanks. towards the alliance? Yes I'll be able to tell you the winner of the election within seven days. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, it's very, very, uh, that's, I mean, let me just start there because it's, um, it, we're, we're all watching this and there was a good article on, uh, uh, by uh, um, Joe Klein today that I read said, look, nobody has a clue how this is going to come out. Um, and so we don't, we also don't know, we just know that's how close this race is. Um, and while I have a hunch, if you, you know, get me in a quiet room who I think is going to win, uh, like Joe Klein, I, I don't know at this point. Um, but it will have implications for especially the resourcing on defense. Uh, it won't have implications for how the White House and the occupant of the White House views 
our interests in this region. That's what is constant, and that's what uh, there is a broad bipartisan consensus on. But either man, Romney or Obama, will have still to deal with all of the challenges around the world, especially in the Middle East, and he will also have to deal with real budget fiscal deficit problems. So those are the two big constraints on any rebalancing in terms of resourcing uh, the, uh, the actual presence. Um, uh, I think there's also a practical impediment to an East Asia strategy report. We actually helped write the unclassified, non-official one before the Obama administration took over. That was uh, Jim Kelly, former assistant secretary in the Bush administration, helped with, with Kurt Campbell and others. Um, and the reason they couldn't get this through the Obama administration was because of bureaucratic politics. And as we broaden the concept to Indo-Pacific, um, it's even more difficult because you're now crossing too many different offices and secretaries and the White House and Defense and, and you know, um, both these gentlemen can tell you, I'm sure, lots of stories about the difficulty of getting documents passed through. One way or the other, though, the, you're right, Peter, the administration will have to articulate uh, a kind of a long-term vision, but unlike the Asia, uh, Asian century vision, um, I hope it is more strategic and that it, is link, it links means with ends. Yes. And this is what's very important. And I'm not confident that it'll do so because we're in this such a fiscally constrained environment. It's a lot easier for politicians, frankly, to talk about what their vision is than it is how they're going to actually get there. And on that sober note, I should stop talking. No, it's, Admiral Ruffhead, uh, from your perspective, what can an election mean to the region? And uh, I'm opinion? very consistent uh, with what Patrick said. I mean, it's extraordinarily close. And, uh, uh, but I do believe uh, and that, to, to spring off what Doug said, the view within uh, the United States uh, is that that this region is extraordinarily important. That's not going to change, um, and, and so it will be a question of degrees. Uh, but even there, um, as the belt tightens, uh, this uh, the emphasis on our forces here, the capabilities that we have here, will maintain the high priority. There's no question about that, and and. And the aversion that we will have to large ground campaigns in distant lands uh, is not going to be a burden on the budget. And so I think, uh, you know, will there be some trimming on the margins? Perhaps emphasis, capabilities will be relevant to the region and the issue. And Doug Fyth, you've been watching obviously closely the Republican campaign. Um, what do you think the chances are? Well, I, I have to say, I think. Patrick and Gary have, have covered the, the ground pretty nicely. I, I think that uh, there are important national security differences, I think, between Obama and Romney, but not so much you know, directly related to this region. Uh, the main one being the uh, Romney would promote larger defense spending. Whether he'll get it is another question, but at least as you know, the president doesn't get everything he wants, but he would come in with, a, with the intention to have larger defense spending than I, I think Obama would have. That matters, but, um, but aside from that, I think the, the broader concept of you know, the strategic view of the United States in the region wouldn't change enormously. Well, time to throw it out to the floor, I think. Any <coughs> questions, please? Um. Um, William Kuchera, is, is there any significant um, relationship between the, the, the use of the term pivot by the Obama administration and um, Admiral Patrick Walsh, who has spoken of the need to take Mackinder to sea and, um, and Southeast Asia or the South China Sea as a, uh, as a sort of Euro, uh, maritime equivalent of the Eurasian heartland? Uh, if there was, I wasn't. You know, to, to give you the actual origins of the term, it's, it's much less sexy than that. Um, although my good colleague Robert Kaplan and, and others have written about uh, the revenge of geography in his latest book and earlier Monsoon talked about, uh, in, in writing with me as well, why the South China Sea in particular is a very important strategic area as China moves offshore uh, uh, to the maritime domain and we're, we're, we're entering a, a rebirth of, uh, of Alfred Thayer Mahan. Uh, in many ways, it seems, in terms of the importance of maritime and air power. 
uh, in the global commons, as we call it anyhow, with space and cyber. But the, the actual pivot term, I think, probably came from my good friend, Nirav Patel, also from the center, um, thinking about it. And I think the reason it struck with the, the State Department before Obama saw it as a basketball term uh, was because the Democrats thought this was a nice way to emphasize that they were peacemaking. They were pivoting out of war toward economic opportunity initially. I think that, that was probably his sense. Narab does a lot of work on India, watching the economic opportunity. But it happened to coincide with other strategic thinking, including the one you allude to, sir, that probably made it generally interesting until they spoke it in public, realized as uh, a very senior American ambassador said this type, you know, the word is inept and inapt. Um, you know, this idea of a rapid pivot is exactly what we're not doing. There's nothing rapid about it. It's actually long term. You've got to keep one foot down so you can't leave, you know, the Middle East. So it, it's unfortunately not really an apt phrase. That's why rebalancing just became a more acceptable way to say, look, we're putting growing priority on the Asia Pacific and even the Indo Pacific. Um, and yes, there are geostrategic implications of this, but not. Most in Washington, unlike Canberra, don't think in geostrategic terms. While we get ready for the next fine. question, uh, General Ruffhead, can you tell us a little bit about how the early stages of the uh, stationing of US troops and the movement of the Navy towards uh, this region has actually gone step by step? Because well, uh, in your I, last stage as uh, Navy chief, you're involved in yeah, almost actually, laying the groundwork. Actually, you know, Doug's point, we began the movement of particularly naval forces uh, years ago uh, in the Bush administration. Um, and it was very simple. I mean, as uh, you know, we had been sized 50-50, kept everyone happy, equal shares. Uh, when the challenge of the Soviet Union and particularly the campaign in Europe, uh, the potential campaign in Europe went away, and you just look at the economic interests, the importance of, of how the, the, the global economy is fueled from Asia, when you look at the size of the ocean, where you want to be and the types of things that you want to have to assure the, the sea lanes. Um, it's just a mathematical reality that you shift. And that began with the shifting of some submarines to move them full, uh, farther forward in the region to Guam. We rebalanced the number of aircraft carriers to put more aircraft carriers uh, into the Pacific. Uh, but it's more than just a numbers count. If you look at the capabilities and how we field those capabilities, the leading edge is always coming to the forward deployed forces here. Uh, so there's a qualitative and then there's a quantitative shift. And essentially, with the exception of a few surface combatants, uh, the 6040 was done quite some time ago. Uh, the Air Force began to look in the same way. And, and, I, and again, I would say that you know, don't simply look at the numbers, but underneath those numbers, there's a qualitative advantage uh, that, that we enjoy out here as well. Stephen Loosley, next question. Thanks, Catherine. Stephen Loosley from ASPE. Gentlemen, we tend to see the evolution of our alliance against the rise of China as being a major geostrategic player. Could I shift the focus a little and just ask what challenges uh, arise for the alliance as India emerges as a major geostrategic player? Do we see a difference in emphasis here? Do we see different challenges, political, diplomatic, interoperability, interoperability and, the, uh, and the like? Well, Doug, why don't you start and then we'll move down the Well, I think that we look at India, obviously, uh, very differently from the way we look at China. India is also a rising power. But it's uh, a rising power that the United States has looked at as a uh, potentially enormously valuable partner in, uh, in, in numerous ways. I mean, we have, we have um, military cooperation, but we also have uh, economic ties to India, and I mean, as we do with China. But I mean, India is viewed as a strategic opportunity. And uh, I think. It may very well be that some, several decades down the road, when people look back on the, the Bush administration's national security policy and a lot of the extremely hot controversies, things that were highly controversial at the time have faded 
into history, it would not surprise me at all if people looking back say one of the most important things that occurred during the Bush years was the, uh, the initial great blossoming of a strategic relationship between the United States and India. Um, and it's, I think it's continued. This is also an element of bipartisanship in the United States because I think that people in the Obama administration also believe that India is a, uh, is a great strategic opportunity. And I think you know, the, that's an example where uh, you, don't, you don't have a lot of division. Um, and I mean, it might be worthwhile at some point to talk about where there are some divisions, because I, I wouldn't want to leave everybody here with the impression that, that, that it, across the board in the national security area, there's nothing to choose between uh, in the presidential election. There are important differences, but I think so far we've highlighted areas of, uh, of where there would be continuity. We might move on. On the India subject, Admiral? Yeah, I, I would say that um, you know, I've placed great priority on uh, the relationship with India, the interoperability with, uh, with the Indian military. Um, and one can say that it, it moves slowly, and I know there are some gentlemen here uh, that I spoke with before once that have dealings uh, with India, and I think they would agree that it's, it's a, a challenging place to drive toward interoperability. That said, uh, if you look at the fact that they've purchased from the United States a large amphibious ship, uh, that they are taking delivery of the P-8 airplane, uh, the same one that we are taking, at about the same time. Um, you know, I, I think those are very encouraging signs, but they also uh, are still very mindful of not um, putting all their eggs in one basket, so their market uh, is a little broader. I do believe that one of the important things that must be done are some of what I would call the foundational agreements that are so important in effective interoperability, which is the sharing of logistics, common agreements on command and control, uh, uh, security, and, uh, uh, and agreements there. Those, I think, are extremely important and need to be, uh, need to be resolved with, uh, with India in order to, to get that closeness that I think We are important. moving towards uh, the end of our program. Patrick, um, on the same subject, if you could, but also, as we're nearly out of time, Lessons or directions you'd like to see Australia consider in the alliance over the next uh, short period of time? Two points about India that will then relate to Australia. First is that first economic opportunity during the Bush administration in terms of identifying this great new partnership. Unfortunately, the low-hanging fruit was grasped rather quickly. The economy of India started to slow down, and notwithstanding Prime Minister Singh's attempt to uh, boost it just recently, Nobody is projecting higher but rather lower economic growth over the next decade or so for India. So India is going to be a long-term partner and it's going to grow. It's just going to grow more slowly than we had hoped. Um, Geostrategically, if I can go back to the initial question, um, real estate matters here. And whether it's the Strait of Malacca um, or whether it's uh, over Myanmar, the landlines of communication that China is building to kind of break out of its um, uh, semi-enclosed littoral sea challenge, um, the Indian maritime contributions are particularly important. That's why the, what we see in this Look East policy is most significant in the Indo-Pacific is, is in the maritime domain, whether it's with Australia or with the United States or with Japan or with all three of those uh, countries. And I think my, th my third point would simply be to say we're not going into a, a, a period of uh, creating strong bilateral alliances. That's why we better keep the strong bilateral alliance we have here you know, with US-Australia or trilateral, if it's ANZUS. But the point is, um, uh, what we're going to see is growing security cooperation with key countries. And when you think about India and Australia, Japan, South Korea, their capabilities really matter in this region. And the more that they can cooperate bilaterally, trilaterally, and otherwise, uh, the better this region will be uh, stabilized so that we can get on with the kind of economic opportunity we're all trying to grasp in this century. Uh, Peter Jennings, thank, thank you Patrick. Peter Jennings, um, moving towards closing up now, um, can you give some brief thoughts on how you think the arrival of the Marines has gone in Darwin and moving towards the second phase? How has Australia responded and what do you think in the alliance needs to really be considered by politicians? Uh, Catherine, I think it's been uh, a positive movement so far. Um, there, there have been opinion polls which uh, put uh, popular support for 
uh, the Marine and Air Force presence at around 70%. Uh, most people in this room would know it's very hard to get 70% of Australians to agree on anything. So I think that you know that does reflect a continuing high level of endorsement for the uh, uh, for the for the new activities in the relationship. Uh, it's also welcomed in the Northern Territory as well, um, you know, not least for the financial injection that it, that it provides. So for me, the issue is um, um, to sustain the momentum uh, to actually produce tangible, practical um, uh, uh, cooperation on the ground, to take it further and faster into what was called Phase 2, which was the Indian Ocean focus. And I think to now bring on what I read are very clear signals coming from uh, Washington about the, the, uh, the value of uh, ballistic missile defence as a sort of a new area or, or an expanded area of cooperation between the, the two governments. The, the worst of all possible worlds would be to talk the talk but then not to back it up with the financial Funding's support the that, that's, that's needed. And I do have a little bit of worry about that in, in both capitals. Uh, so in a sense I think now's the time for the US to keep its expectations high of Australia and for Australia to uh, you know, continue to sort of unfold the, uh, the expansion of uh, cooperation quickly. Admiral Ruffhead, on the Alliance, your vision, your thoughts for the next... No, as I said, I think it, it, um, it, it uh, is one that is likely to go forward uh, in a very, very positive way, but to echo what Peter said, uh, in a very practical sense, when you talk about military capability, you are what you buy, and it's as simple as that, and, uh, and you can't deny that. That's right. I think all of the, the observations that have been made about interoperability, equipment, trade, uh, military balance are all important, correct, and, and key elements of the alliance. But I'd like to emphasize something that hasn't come up, which is the philosophical uh, aspect of the alliance. The essence of the alliance is, is the commitment that the United States has and that Australia has to liberal democracy. And uh, it's, you know, it's one of these things that doesn't come up, it sounds soft. It is more of a motivation than, if, if you actually sit in government circles and hear people talk about what's important and what needs to be done, and when political leaders make decisions, you know, by God, we're going to do that, and people make all kinds of practical observations about why it might not be a great idea or another, but if you're talking about defending an ally who is a liberal democracy, and it's you know, part of your sense of, of what's right and also what's practical because liberal democracies have interests that tie into each other. If a liberal democracy gets eaten up by an enemy that's not a free country, that has implications for the freedom of, of people all around the world. It's an often ignored and often underemphasized aspect and I just wanted to make sure that, that you know, nobody goes away from here thinking it's all about hardware and, and military balance. We will just have one more sort of round of questions, only because it's so fascinating, I think, having the people here. We don't want to rush off, but we will finish very soon. We've talked a little bit about, indirectly, about the Republican campaign because of Doug's association with the former administration. We've talked about the pivot, the rebalance. We haven't talked directly <coughs> about President Obama. Can we just quickly reflect through the panel? Obama's defence policy, um, Strengths, weaknesses, a very broad topic, front of mind issues right now in the US on it. Perhaps we'll start with Peter. Well, look, I'll say two things quickly. I think, firstly, the Asia-Pacific policy has been good, and it's been driven by uh, the right combination of people in both state and uh, Office of the Secretary of Defence. Uh, we, we're, we'll see a little pause if, if Obama is, is returned because uh, Secretary Clinton has gone, Kurt Campbell has uh, left from, uh, from uh, state, Michelle Flournoy has, uh, has left from defence, so there is, there is a need now to sort of refill the, the, some of the critical positions and that, that will always take time. Uh, uh, one thing I would say more generally, um, uh, you know, Obama um, um, in, inherited uh, two wars and has attempted to, uh, to uh, get out of both. I think we will see a much faster US withdrawal from Afghanistan than is currently on the public record if the Obama administration has returned. And he's run extremely quiet on that during the course of the election campaign. But that would be something I'd be looking out for early in the new year. Patrick? Well, you only have one president at a time, so I'm not going to be too critical of our current president. 
uh, in particular the Asian team, I think, has rightly won the internal fight on putting a growing priority on the Asia Pacific. So I strongly support what Kurt Campbell and others have been doing and, and succeeding in doing. Um, on the defense budget, um, I mean, Secretary Gates had such strong leadership, uh, but it was interesting to see the shift under the Gates regime to we have to fight and win the current wars, as the first 2010 quadrennial defense reviews stated. And then secondly, we have to think about all these long-term things, you know, China and uh, anti-access area denial. That sort of shifted as the administration, as the White House, it went through their third review on Afghan policy and decided, you know what, we need to get out of all these wars as soon as possible. They're not going well, they're too costly. And as they were kind of hastily retreating for arbitrary deadlines to meet, um, and not throwing more money in defense, but actually cutting defense, and cutting things like the size of our Navy, so that you know, in the course of this year alone, the Obama administration defense policy um, went from, we are building a 313 ship Navy, Suddenly that dropped off the chart and no longer. And yet you still have Obama surrogates and one will be here next week talking about this strong Navy they're building. So I, anyway, it, we do have great capabilities, great qualitative capabilities. I don't want to understate our capabilities. But over some time, the, the decisions that Obama's making right now in defense do have long-term implications if we keep going down this path. And I do worry about that. And I'd want from your perspective. Yeah, I, I would say that I think the, the shift, at least from our perspective in the Navy, uh, the rebalance was something we had been advocating since our maritime strategy in 2007, so we were very pleased with that. Uh, but uh, with respect to the last comment I made about you are what you buy, um, I believe that we have a great risk of a, a strategy resource mismatch as we go forward for the reasons that Patrick mentioned. And Doug, obviously from the former administration, you've watched from your own perspective, without the politics, what are some, some thoughts? There is a, a debate in the United States about America's proper role in the world. And I think that there's been pretty much a, uh, a consensus in what one might call establishment circles from the liberal side to the conservative side about a number of basic propositions about the importance of American leadership, about the uh, the idea that our interests in the world are related to freedom, to democracy, the, the concept of the free world, the idea that American freedom of action is extremely important. Um, and those have been left to right consensus ideas for decades. There are people in the United States who have challenged that. They've tended to come from uh, progressive circles in, in academe. And I think that President Obama is our first president who basically comes from progressive academic circles. And I, and I think he has quite a different image uh, of the proper role of the United States in the world. I think he's like, he would like to change the idea of American leadership, play it down, make it more that the United States is, is a consensus player rather than a leader. Uh, he is much less interested in American freedom of action than he is in trying to integrate the United States more into multilateral bodies and, and uh, wait on UN Security Council decisions before we take actions and the like. And I think those are quite important differences between the two candidates. And I think President Obama has been very constrained, even though he, some of his ideas are, are uh, as I said, out of the mainstream on these things, but he's been very constrained for political reasons. If he gets a second term, I think he will probably be bolder in trying to reshape the United States and its role in the world along the lines that he basically favors. Well, I think we've been indeed privileged to have such experts here today. We're out of time. I'd like you to join me in thanking them very much, and we'll see you at the next ASCII function. Thank you.